Kevin Harrington is chairman and founder of TV Goods, Inc. Uh, he's a pioneer and principal architect of the infomercial industry. So he's the guy that started it all. Uh, but we've come to know him as the sharp looking shark seated at the left end of the shark tank on ABC's hit uh, reality show Shark Tank. Uh, in 1984, Kevin produced one of the industry's first 30 minute infomercials. Since then, he has been involved with over 500 product launches that resulted in sales of over $4 billion worldwide. Kevin recently released a book entitled Act Now. If you haven't read it, highly recommend it. It's a fascinating book. Uh, Act Now, How I Turn Ideas into Million Dollar Products. That chronicles his life and experiences in the DRTV industry. Please join me in welcoming Kevin Harrington. students uh, like to kind of go back in time a little, if you will. We're going to start with what was life like growing up in the Hyde Park section of Cincinnati? Cincinnati, uh, Hyde Park it's, was a pretty conservative sort of neighborhood. Um, I was uh, one of six children, um, Catholic family. Uh, my father was a restaurateur, entrepreneur by the way, um, and um, I started when I was 11 years old. Uh, washing dishes for my father, so I would, you know, he um, instilled in me the uh, uh, the work ethic to, you know, to earn income. And um, I had a uh, my mother was also actually entrepreneurial too, so I think I had an advantage uh, growing up with two entrepreneurial parents. My my mother, while she was raising six kids, um, operated and owned. She was a partner in a nursery school, so. Um, so that was pretty cool. I got to see the inner workings of that, but also the inner workings of, of um, you know, my father's restaurant business. But um, um, I grew up with some kids uh, that were were wealthier than than our family was, and so that was something that instilled in me also a desire uh, to kind of be on the same level as them. Uh, one of my friends, his father owned the Cincinnati Reds, and another one's. His father was the chairman and CEO of the Kroger's Food Corporation, and so they had jets and they had this and they had that. And, and my father was, was he owned a, you know Harrington's Irish Pub, and so you know that's you know I was I was slopping dishes uh, and and uh, bar backing, and my friends were jetting off to uh, Daytona Beach every uh, every summer in their in their father's uh, jets. Okay, so it was an interesting interesting. I, I saw both sides of. Of, of, uh, of life at that point, the, the, the high life. And, you know, my father kind of struggled because, you know, operating a restaurant in, uh, in those days, you know, could be successful, but putting six kids through, you know, and, and also in not, you know, fairly decent schools, you know, at least until it got to me, okay? Because yeah. they, they ran out of money, yeah, which sure. I, I was number four out of the six. So uh, I was number four out of six. There you go, okay? Three boys and three girls. By the way, uh, what was life like with the siblings? Um, we got along pretty well. Uh, two older sisters, an older brother. Um, my um, my older brother would beat the hell out of me, but uh, you know that, that was a good thing. I would beat the hell out of my older brother. <laughs> okay. Um, so um, to this day, we have a very close family. Um, I'm I'm right in my my oldest sister's in. Uh, she's 65. I'm 54, I have a brother 45, and we're all in between. So, um, you know, pretty big spread actually, 20 year spread. So um, there, there's a joke that we tell at one of the family events, my, my younger brother, um, he was sitting, we're sitting at Thanksgiving dinner, and my, there was 20 years between him, his age, and my older brother, actually 18 years between the, the two brothers. And my, my older brother had moved out of the house uh, very early on, when he was like uh, in high school, and and so he was looking across the table. And he's like, "Who's that guy over there?" Was, was, was you older, recognize his older him. brother, right? You wow, know, it was a pretty big spread. Absolutely, and I know you mentioned a little bit about your mother. You said she was an entrepreneur, but could you paint a picture for us? Uh, because mothers influence us a lot as men, right? 
Yes. You know, paint a picture. What was she like? What kind of woman was she? Oh, my mother, uh, she was unbelievable. Um, passed away about uh, nine years ago, God bless, but um, went to church six days a week. Um, I mean, every morning at 7 a.m., she and a little group of, of, of her friends, they went to church, um, and it was just an amazing, she was very structured and, um, um, you know, like I remember, you know, like I have a 13 year old, I have a 22 year old also, but you know, the, the stuff that the kids tend to get away with today, um, you know, I travel so much, so it's, you know, partially my fault, but you know, I remember I could only have one Coca-Cola uh, a week and it was on Friday Same. night. I was allowed to have a Coca-Cola bed every night at a certain time. And, and now I, I think of my, my son, in the 13 years old, and, and, and how he gets away with, with so much. It, you know, I wish there was some structure like I had, um, you know, when my mother uh, raised me. It was, it was, you know, I was you know, right under her thumb the whole time. It was, it was a pretty interesting experience. And, of course, um, I grew up, uh, went to a Catholic grade school, went to an all-boys Catholic high school uh, in Cincinnati. So um, that was, you know, what she wanted. And I think it was, uh, you know, it was good for, for structure for, for me. Excellent, thank you. Um, and tell us a little bit about your dad, if you will. Because I know he played a huge role in your life, um, really instilling, you mentioned before, business ethics. Where did that, that come from? Just describe him, create that picture for us. If My father, um, he was um, a World War II, uh, uh, really hero, um, went to, uh, when he was 19, uh, didn't get um, uh, drafted, he enlisted in the Air Force because he didn't want to be in, just get drafted, be in the Army, he said, I want to fly a plane. So went over uh, in, in the year 1940, I guess. He, my father will be 90 in a couple of months, uh, so we're having a big uh, birthday party for him back in Cincinnati. But when, when you went, when you think about going to the war, uh, and, and, and these days when they fly, jets way up there, they're dropping bombs from, you know, 30, 40,000 feet up and boom, boom, boom. In those days, they were dropping them from 100 feet above uh, the water. They uh, were above, in the, above the land, rather. I mean, they were strafing like this and they, they would go out. He started with 300, 300 um, uh, pilots that started in his squadron. And you had an obligation as, when you joined the Air Force, when you were done with 25 missions, you were allowed to, you were done because you risked your life every day when you went up and, and they would go up in, in the morning, eight or 10 of them would go out and you know, six or seven of them would come back and, and literally, you know, two out of three of the, of the, of the people in his squadron ended up uh, dying in, in, in battle. And so, and then 10 are going out and of course a couple then, oh wait a minute, my engine's not working so well, so they, you know, turn around and go home, because they know that they may be dead by the end of the day, you know? So my father, though, they developed a camaraderie, and with a couple of the, the key guys, because these young kids were coming in, after him doing this for a year, and he'd done, flown his 25 missions, he's like, I, these young kids coming in don't know how to fly. And they were up against German Messerschmitts uh, back in these days, so the, the, um, the U.S. planes weren't near the technological um, uh, specimen that you know it's kind of like the Mercedes of, of Germany and, and BMWs up against you know Ford you know type uh, cars today type of thing you know so um, not nothing against the U.S. automakers but uh, take it easy <laughs> in those days it was a big difference okay but anyway he ended up um, not leaving and they developed this camaraderie with a few of them. He flew 75 missions, 100 missions, over 150 missions, and he was allowed to go home after 25. And these are these. This was just an unbelievable um, camaraderie. And they ended up finally got shot down twice. He got all kinds of medals, and he came home really a war hero. And went from there. What kind of business did he wanted? To, you know, he was wanted to be in his own business, and there was nothing better because he was kind of a locally well-known guy. Coming home, my mother was the was the daughter of the bank president, Fifth Third Bank. Fifth Third Bank started in Cincinnati. Her father was president of Fifth Third Bank. She fell in love with my father, and uh, so it was really these two opposite worlds. You know, she came from a very structured banking environment, and he was a war hero. And um, they ended up getting married, 
and um, he ended up in the restaurant business because he knew everybody in town. So, so when you went to Harrington's Bar or, the, you know, he had rib, rib joints, Irish pubs, supper clubs, lobster joints, you, know, you name it, he was, he was an entrepreneur. That's awesome. And if I may ask, just because you brought it up, um, how did your mother growing up in that more formal banking institutional type uh, environment, how did she really resonate with her new love uh, opening up an Irish pub? Uh, I'm not sure she liked it, to be honest with you. <laughs> uh, because, you know, there would be good weeks and there would be tough weeks, you know? Um, you know, it was, um, I, I, you know, when I was in college, uh, she wanted me to be a doctor, she wanted me to be a lawyer, and, um, you know, my oldest sister was president of the sorority, and she married a doctor. Um, my next, uh, she married a lawyer, actually, and then my oldest uh, brother, uh, rather, my, old, my second oldest sister, she married uh, a, a lawyer, and my brother was, my oldest brother, in, in, uh, in 65, 64, 60 now, the three of them, uh, so, you know, they had me by a few years. Um, he was a corporate executive for Gillette. And so that was how she wanted her kids to be raised, okay? Um, and, and so my father really was the opposite of all of that, but, but he was working literally. He, in his last restaurant, when I worked in his restaurant, um, I went, uh, he would go in, it was, it was a, a nightclub, uh, supper club. Um, they would go in, he would eat rather, they opened at noon every day for lunch, closed at 2.30 in the morning, and he was there for every hour of every day. So if you think, if you, if you do the math there on time, he would get home after 3 o'clock in the morning, but be there by 11.30 the next day to open it up six days a week. And so that was his life. And so I didn't see my father a lot. Never, never saw him for dinner, all through school, and we took very few vacations because he couldn't afford to get away for, for weeks because he was in, in a small business like this. Um, you know, I, I know um, uh, there was just so much thievery going on inside that, that business. I saw it. Um, I saw chefs taking steak, boxes of steaks out to the garbage. And, my, you know, I remember one day my father said, why is the chef taking the garbage out, you know? And he's like, come here, let me, let me check that out. And inside there were these big boxes of, of steaks with a little bit of garbage on the top. And um, I'll never forget the, um, you know, my father was, you know, he was very, very sharp. And he's like, I want you to count how many kegs of beer are being delivered, uh, you know, because we got to, you know, we got to count for the, the beer deliveries. And so uh, he comes into the kitchen and I'm, I'm counting, he's got a good count on this? I'm like, yeah, he said, wait a minute, driver. And he looks over and he says, let me see these, these kegs here. And he says, take that one off. There was two kegs that came in. Take that one off of there. And underneath, he, he had already delivered two in, two out. Uh, you know, two empties out, two full ones in, two empties out. Well, the guy's going back to the, back to the truck and he's taking a full one back to the truck. And my father, I said, how, and he, he takes the, the empty off the top, the full one's on the bottom. I said, my father, how did you, he was stealing the keg of beer, the driver. So I said, how did you see? They said, that bottom keg was sweating. And he said, these are the things you have to be looking for as an entrepreneur. So it was just unbelievable. The bus boys were stealing steak knives. And this was, you know, I mean, I learned, I was 11 years old. And, and, and I saw, you know, the waitresses giving away free meals and drinks, and it was it was just mind blowing to see the thievery that was going on in this small little little restaurant that my father was operating. That I'm glad you brought that up. Um, and speaking of the the beer keg, I'm just gonna piggyback on that a little bit. Uh, your dad caught this delivery driver, right, stealing from him, and his lesson to you that day was, don't trust anybody, right? Yes. Okay. Yet somehow you ended up with the complete opposite attitude, trusting everyone until they give you a reason not to. How did that yeah. happen? I, you know, I, I'm not totally sure how. I think maybe but that came, that was probably from my mother, okay? So, uh, because my father was very, of course he had, he had been, you know, at that time many years through the restaurant business, and, and really um, rightfully saw that it was, you know, he'd been burned so many times before 
that that was his attitude, don't trust anybody, and, and only until they gave you reason. Because, you know, I, I, I would see people that seemed to be the nicest people in the world that he would later tell me what this person had done or this person had done. So, so, so I think that's, that was, was certainly his mentality. My mother, I think, instilled in us the, the, the opposite. And so, um, you know, I think that, um, you know, and, and to this day, I think probably one of, of my faults in business um, is I, 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 I tend to, I, I like to give people the benefit of the doubt. Um, I like to believe that, um, you know, that we can, you know, we do a lot of, a lot of deals, a lot of ventures, and uh, it's funny, in Shark Tank, um, you know, we find out the hard way though too, and we, we really have the reverse attitude on Shark Tank now. Uh, we pretty, pretty much don't trust, trust very much of what's said, uh, because first of all, imagine I'm sitting here just like this, somebody comes out, gives a three minute pitch, and now I have to decide whether I'm gonna make an investment in their, their business or not. And I have to take the attitude, okay, we'll do a deal, but, I'm not going to trust everything that I just heard because a good example, a, a one woman came out and it's how you know. So how big is your business? What you know? What what are your numbers? Oh, I've grown the business to seven hundred thousand dollars a year. Oh, fantastic. Okay, so seven hundred thousand. What's your profit? Well, she, you know. So we went through this whole scenario. So I I made a deal, bought into her company, fifty percent ownership. When we do the due diligence, I looked at her numbers last year, her sales. The previous 12 month period was 250,000. Wow. So I'm like, well, you, you induced me to buy half your company for X amount of dollars based on the representation that you were doing $700,000 a year. Oh, she said, I grew it to 700. That was two years ago. Now I'm doing 250, okay? So she went like this and like this. Okay, well, of course, you know, I had to do my due diligence and it was a, you know, a little bit misleading the way she answered my question. So. You know, at the end of the day, I think, you know, in business, you know, I think there's a personal life and there's a business life. And um, I'll say this, before I make an investment, I pretty much have to check all the facts and figures and, and, and have to have that attitude that I can't trust everything I'm hearing. I want to see facts. I want to see contracts. I want to see due diligence. Very good. I was actually curious about that on Shark Tank. Like, once you make a commitment live on national television, are you obligated, or can you still do the due diligence? So, yes, yeah, it's it, everything is subject uh, two sides to due diligence on both sides. Um, we had, I mean, I had a gentleman. I bought half of his company for a, it was one hundred and fifty thousand dollars, and in the due diligence, I, I found an amazing business that this guy had. Um, I went up uh, to Chicago. He had a customized um, a pro a protein bar, a nutritional um, energy bars. And so you could order, a, a, he had a, any one of thousands of different ingredients you could put in this. So unlike when you go to the health food store and you get the pre made it's already yeah. made, you could get you know, uh, vitamins added, you could get protein, you could get fiber, you could get this, you could get that on a customized basis, pumpkin seeds, up, 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 thousands of different combinations. So I go to his place and I walk in and there's hundreds of people walking around with hairnets on, and big machines and all this. This is a small time business guy. And I'm like, wow, what, you know, this, how do you afford all this overhead? Your sales don't support all this. What, what's going on? Oh, he said, I rent a little corner from this place in the back of this, of this facility and they do runs in between their runs as they have downtime. So pretty much remnant manufacturing. And I was blown away at how this guy had structured this business because he was getting it done on a per piece basis, no overhead, locked in on his profit. I was really impressed with this guy's business model that he, he could only make money because he had a fixed overhead himself and one employee, he was getting everything done on a per piece basis, no matter what all the overhead was, was the rent, the utilities, the insurances, everything in this whole place. Um, so anyway, make a long story short, we entered into the deal to do this deal. He's like, you know what? I just want to wait until Shark Tank airs before we sign the papers. And I'm like, well, no, let's, you know, let's get the deal done now. Well, why, why, why? Because the day that the show aired, he generated $100,000 in orders which his company was 60 grand a year in sales. 
He did 100,000 in one week. Okay? Thank you, Kevin. All right? So, and that's one of the reasons why I want to own half of this company. Okay? So, you know, uh, as we know as investor sharks that when somebody comes on Shark Tank, we're going to be not only those airings, but those, they, they rebroadcast those, plus some of the successful invest in, in, in rather entrepreneurs that come on the show, they get on Good Morning America, yeah. they get all of a sudden, yeah, exactly. this guy, he leveraged it in Chicago Tribune, front page story, guy, you know, Shark Tank exposure builds the company. Well, guess what? Wasn't 150,000 for half? You know, it almost quadrupled what he wanted. Went to over half a million dollars for half of his company. Because his valuation just because went Because the valuation went like this, and now we've now found so there's some people that come on the show just for the exposure. We have since found out that that's one of the Makes most sense. factors. Makes sense. Let's jump back a little bit. Uh, what kind of friends did you keep as a teenager? Yeah. Well, because um, we lived in a decent neighborhood, and 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 we were on the, the you know probably you know in real estate they say you know, buy the, the cheapest house in the, in the great neighborhood, and that's kind of what we had. Um, because my mother wanted to be in the right side of town in the right kind of neighborhood, but we couldn't afford the big homes that, you know, all these other guys had. So, um, and fortunately, from the school I went to to the guys I hung out with, they were, you know, well-to-do families. And we were actually, you know, you know, I was, you know, at 11 years old, I took two buses to get to my father's restaurant. I, I'd get done with school at three, I'd be at, his, at, at, at work by 4.30, finish up, you know, uh, homework, whatever, and sometimes do it at, at, at uh, the restaurant. Um, and, and I'd get home, I, I got a ride home because it was a little dangerous taking two buses home at 10, 11 o'clock at night, but I did this, you know, uh, you know multiple days uh, a week, and I worked a 40 hour week. So, um, and my friends, they were all hanging out, you know, doing their thing, Party. which was definitely, definitely not, uh, not working. So, um, I, I definitely had the work ethic. In fact, when I was 15, uh, during the summer, I started a driveway ceiling business and I jumped on a bicycle, went and knocked on doors, um, uh, you know, basically selling uh, in Cincinnati. In the wintertime, it got cold. And so, if you had cracks in your driveway, um, when the water got in there and it got cold, they would, the, the water would freeze and the cracks would get bigger. So I'd knock on their door, and then, plus their, their driveways, a lot of times, you know, we'd go into neighborhoods where they just built these homes, and, and two years later, the, the, the asphalt was starting to fade. So I had a beautification, a protection and beautification program for these, for these driveways, basically. And so I'd go into a neighborhood, get one driveway done on the cheap, so I could put my sign up across it, and boy, that that beautiful black driveway from the asphalt uh, coating that we put on there was a, was a magical transformation. And so that's one of the things I say I look for in an infomercial is, I, you know, we look for products um, that we sell on TV that have some kind of magical transformation, like an Acme product or a Tony Little fitness product where you're gonna get six pack abs, okay? So I was doing this, you know, literally now, you know, this is close to 40 years ago. Um, doing magical transformations of people's driveways, and uh, so this was a, this was a business I started when I was 15 years old in, in Cincinnati. I get done doing my selling, and then go hang out with my buddies. Okay, and they're you know <laughs> drinking strohs back in those days. I remember. Okay, so um, uh, what was the uh, uh, the initial approach that you used to market that business, and, and did it work? The Very initial, initial do you remember? the initial approach. Um, well. Basically, the the concept there was to because I, I would go in a neighborhood and I was you know if, if you imagine me um, you know almost 40 years ago how young I looked knocking on someone's door and telling them I'm gonna you know want to sell them something they're like looking over like where's you know, where's the owner where's your parents? Say, you know so I was on my bicycle um, so so I would go through a neighborhood hit 30 doors and not get one sale. Um, it, you know, it was just like devastating. So, so then I figured out I have to get some credibility. I got to get one. I don't care what it takes. I'll give it away almost just for the labor, for the cost. I'm not no labor. I was the labor for the cost of goods. So um, we would. I would, and I had a partner actually who was 16 who had. A, we bought a truck so he could drive because we had to, you know, go pick up our materials or we, you know, we couldn't couldn't do the, the the work without a without a vehicle. So we would. I would go in the neighborhood, I was at sales end, and I would get somebody 
to give us a commitment. Yeah, okay, go. 20 bucks, you're gonna do my driveway for $20? Okay, I'm in. And so we get one driveway done, then we put a sign across the driveway, take some before and after pictures, and then go back in the neighborhood. I mean, I'd get 15 to the 30. I mean, it was unbelievable. So we needed credibility. And you, you gotta think about it. In those days, there was all these articles about, you know, there, there was a, there, in, in our city, and I don't know, every city I think has, there was the, the Williams brother clan that would come through town, take a bunch of money from homeowners, they were gonna do some kind of gutter cleaning or whatever, and they're gonna take your money and be done, you know, and go on and off to, you know, you know, everyone would call the Better Business Bureau of these guys, but, so everyone was skeptical, and especially, you know, my age, so getting a piece of credibility in the market was important. I agree with you, I went through some of uh, what high school did you go to? Uh, Purcell High School. And how did you do there? Uh, I did pretty good. Um, I was uh, hardworking, industrious. Um, I graduated uh, third in my class of about 200 students. Wow. No, we don't, we don't connect on that one. Okay. <laughs> um, did you ever get to work with your dad? I think you said you did, right? Yes. In his restaurant? In his restaurant. In his restaurant. Uh, what was that like for you? I mean, explain. I know you said I went in for this amount of hours, but what was the work like? And did it help that your dad was the owner? Did you get any special treatment, you know, like we would want? Or was it different? No, he, I got no special treatment. Treat, he treated me just like every other uh, dishwasher that he had, okay? <laughs> that was, you know, he, he actually got a dollar an hour to start. That was my pay. And, um, uh, at that time, minimum wage was $1.40, so I wasn't actually even making, he was, I found out the other dishwashers were making $1.40 an hour, and I was only making a dollar, so we had to have that conversation at that certain point, because I, I did a better, better job, in my opinion, than they did, but, um, no, it was, you know, my father and I, uh, we bonded tremendously at that time, because, you know, here, here I am, a dishwasher, and one night, my father walks in, and he's like, well, I got the phone call, from the chef's uh, wife, and he was in a terrible, terrible accident, okay? And I'm like, oh my God, um, you know, and he's like, yeah, well, guess what? I, I don't think he really was in an accident. So what, what do you mean, Dad? Well, he's not coming in tonight, but I asked his wife, you know, uh, when, you know, so how long is he gonna be out? Oh, well, he'll be back tomorrow, okay? So, you know, so, uh, you know, that was, it was a, you know, the restaurant business, you know, so the chef's not gonna show. So guess who was cooking? My father and I. And we're talking steaks and lobsters and some fancy stuff. So how old were you? At that time? I was 11 years old. So so he and I, 11 through about 15. Um, so he and I were in the back rolling up the sleeves, and I'd be cooking and then dishwashing and cooking and dishwashing and back and forth. So um, I learned at an early age how to how to cook, and I, I never I, I learned at an early age. I also did not want to be in the restaurant business the rest of my life. So uh, so that was you know I, I saw too many. Too many uh, things uh, that, you know, look, it, it, I wasn't exposed to um, a lot of different entrepreneurial businesses at that time, but that was one I decided wasn't for me. Same. Okay. Uh, Richard Waitley once said, a man who gives his children habits of industry provides for them better than by giving them a fortune. What does that mean to you? Well, I think I, uh, I, got this not just from my father I saw, you know, from my mother's side in the nursery school, et cetera, absolutely. I think um, my father not only did, he, he was so entrepreneurial that um, in between all of the things he was doing with the restaurant, he was always thinking, you know, uh, you know we gotta find some products because, you know, the restaurant business, it's, it's ups and downs and has stability at times and then not. And so um, he would encourage me and he, he actually was, he would read these business opportunity journals and um, unbelievable things. Like I remember um, we got a, um, he had a business and being in the restaurant business, people would scratch the, the seats and things like that. So we started a vinyl repair business for other restaurants. And um, there, were, there was these heat guns uh, so we bought this little business opportunity. We, he bought it and then he and I operated the business. And we, these, these extremely high temperature heat guns that would, you know, you would, you would match up the, the, uh, the vinyl with, you got this color swatch and we could do before and afters on, on, on seats. They had big rips in them. 
Um, and we started with our own restaurant and then said, well, geez, we can do this for others. So we were in the vinyl repair uh, business and, and then we were doing some vending uh, businesses uh, that, that he got involved with. And um, I'll never forget, uh, he got the franchise uh, in Cincinnati for a company called Magic Fingers, which was these little um, vibrating um, things that would go in uh, under beds in hotels, and you put a quarter in it, and it would vibrate the bed. And, you know those things. and so he and I, you know, would go around and install these magic fingers machines in in hotel rooms all over the city. So um, I was, uh, you know, I had all of this exposure to all these kind of, you know, I can call it today, kind of some crazy, you know, uh, uh, entrepreneurial activities. But it was, uh, it, was, it was very exciting for me to see here my father was working 70 hours a week and still looking out for other opportunities. Don't keep, his, his attitude with me was don't keep all your eggs in one basket. So uh, that was something he said all the time. It's interesting, uh, a common theme in the two or three products that you just said you and your father were involved in was that I just picked up on is instant results. Same thing, and it sounds like your whole life has been that. And now here you are marketing those types of products, which I think it's interesting. I was talking about that. Uh, your friends told you, quote, you got to be just like your father. Your father told you, you got to find something you really want to go out and do on your own. And your mother told you, why would you want to have your own business? Just look at your father. <laughs> With these conflicting messages, Kevin, what made you want to become an entrepreneur? Well, I think, um, you know, it, when I saw the, the fun and excitement that, you know, what the, there was things I liked about the restaurant business. And, you know, my father, um, you know, he, he, you know, he knew so many people in town and, and all, you know, the policemen would come in and the mayor would come in and the ball players. I mean, one of his restaurants uh, was right across the street from Crossley Field. And, and this is where a lot of the, um, uh, the Cincinnati Reds would come and hang out. So I had autographed baseballs and umpires. We got tours of, of, the, uh, of the clubhouse and, and all of that. So, you know, I saw, you know, I, I, I kind of liked that kind of lifestyle, you know. So that's really... You know, um, when, when I looked at the, the other side, which was the corporate world, um, and you know, not, not that you know, I didn't think that I could do it, but you know, I tend to get bored easily, and, and so you know, I, I found that you know, that lifestyle of hanging out with the ball players and, and, you know, and, and all the fun and excitement, that seemed to be more, more down my alley. You know? so, um, you know, my mother really wanted me to be either a doctor or a lawyer and was very upset. I quit school when I was a junior. Um, I was at the University of Cincinnati, and you know, I'm, I'm not proud to say that I was a college dropout. Uh, you know, uh, I had, you know, I think part of the challenge I had, um, I'll never forget, when, when I went to, in, in high school, I graduated my senior year. Uh, we were in an advanced program. There was about 10 kids um, that had gone through this program and we took we took tests to get college credit and I started my freshman year with almost most of I had college credit for almost all, all my, my senior year of, of, uh, of high school so um, and so we my last year we had gone through this kind of real close-knit you know really pretty cool high-end uh, structure with teachers um, that you know was was a, a very one-on-one -on -one type of experience I'll never forget First class I went to University of Cincinnati, orientation to business. There was 800 students there, and you know, and 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 the second time I went to that class, the teacher didn't show, and he had a video playing, and he's like, so "Sorry, I couldn't be here today. So today you're gonna, you know, this is your instruction. You know, please listen." And there's paper airplanes going through. The, you know, I'm like, you know, if the teacher can't, if the teacher can't show, you know, why do I have to be there? Okay, so you know, and I got you know, 20 employees sitting back at the office wondering, where's Kevin? You know, so, because I had, a, I started a business while I was in college. So, um, actually, the, the year between graduating high school into my freshman year of college, I started uh, heating and air conditioning business. So, yeah. Okay.
Tri-State Heating, right? Correct. Tell us about that second venture for you. So, um, so I had a couple other businesses outside of the driveway ceiling uh, that I had did, because driveway ceiling was um, summertime only, because it had to be warm for you to apply the, the driveway ceiling. But I did uh, some other things, won't get into all of it, but I uh, had some other, a couple little other part-time businesses um, during the, the colder months. But um, so I had bought a, uh, I, I bought a, a little car when I was, you know, 16, and and, and uh, almost paid cash for it. And it was, was, you know, because my friends were getting their cars, you know, from the, the family, sure. and so I wanted, you know, keep up with my friends and you know, have my own car type of thing. So anyway, make a long story short, though, um, I started to work for in, in when I, in my senior year of high school um, for a heating and air conditioning company called Train, and they would call new homeowners and tell them. Uh, that they 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 were they had an engineer who was out in the neighborhood that could stop by and give them a quote on air conditioning because in those days and this is now back in the I guess late 70s um, or mid 70s um, many homes in Cincinnati didn't have central air conditioning and in the winter in the summertime it got brutally hot I mean very hot and humid almost like temperatures here and so it was you know if you could walk in and show people for thirty nine dollars a month. They could have an air conditioning system. What a deal! So that's what we did. We we went out and just we had appointments set up to uh, to, to tell people how because nobody wanted to write a check for three or four thousand dollars or two or three thousand whatever the number was. But if we could show them how to finance it at thirty nine dollars a month, what could be so bad? So I, as a salesman for um, the training company, I was selling two to three um, systems a week part time, and then a light bulb went off. Well, geez, I think I could do this um, as a business, and I started a company then uh, called uh, called Tri-State, and and what I did was I wanted I don't want to call it Harrington's, you know, because that sounded you know like you know Kevin Harrington, who am I? I'm a young kid, you know. So Tri-State, which Cincinnati is in the Indian Indiana, Ohio, Kentucky area, so Tri-State was kind of a big sounding word. Um, and so what I what I did was I took a full page yellow pages ad out the first year, um, and and I and I and I put four different phone numbers north, south, east, and west, and the three of them were um, answering services that funneled back to the, the main office, um, a call forwarding type situations. Okay, so we were trying to actually. When I researched uh, the trademark Tri-State, I found out that there had been a company that had started in 1956 with Tri-State Heating and Cooling. They still owned the name, but they weren't in any of the yellow pages or anything. So researched the owner and found out that the guy had, had you know, years ago, he had retired, had abandoned the name, wasn't doing anything. I went to his home, uh, Thomas Lee, I think, knocked on his door, and I said, hey, I'm starting a company. And you know, and he he took a liking to me, and he said, you know what? For one dollar, I'll sell you the name and the history of our twenty-some-year-old company. So um, you got twenty-five years of credibility, right? For a dollar, for a dollar. <laughs> but he wanted he wanted to be involved as a mentor, <laughs> consultant to the company. So and he actually and the board of advisors. Yeah, so he 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 said, you know, look. Um, you don't have to pay me to start, but if this if this works out to be something, um, then um, you know I might you know be able to kind of ride around with you guys and help out a little bit. So so um, we became Tri-State Heating and Cooling, 25 years in business, four what looked like offices around the Tri-State area, and overnight we went from zero to a million dollars our first year in business, and we ended up with um, 25 employees. We had six trucks. And uh, this was um, 1976 or so, something like that, while I was in freshman year of college. <laughs> Again, I'm hearing a common theme here with the uh, last business, this business, and, and it sounds like throughout your life. Building credibility is like step one, especially being that you have youth against you, right? Correct. You're younger than, than the, the people you're competing with. So you build your credibility, you look bigger than you are, and all of a sudden clients start hitting. Is that? Yes. Okay. I mean, even today, um, you know, I, in, in new businesses that we start, 
Um, we look for, we're just one of my companies right now, we're, we are um, adding some uh, board of directors members. Sure. And, um, you know, how do you uh, build credibility in the company? Well, you know, I have a track record in what I do, um, but it's entrepreneurial. And, um, you know, and, and if, if you're out raising, you know, right now, we just finished recently a $4 million raise uh, with institutional investors and, you know, Wall Street types, um, you know, big companies that have a very strict set of criteria. Okay, well, we're now on round two of doing a secondary financing with this whole situation. So, we, you know, we, you know, like, okay, great. You got an entrepreneurial track record, and we know you've got you know the ability to do things. But where's the the management team that's going to help take this thing to the next level? So we've got two new board members joining, and this was you know conditioned. Uh, our secondary raise was conditioned upon uh, getting some good advisors to join the board, and one of the people um, that's that's joining the board, and and um, you know this is. You know something that's going to be coming out very shortly, but a gentleman that is—I I won't uh, say his name and everything here because it hasn't been announced yet—but um, he is on several major boards around the the, the, the U.S. public companies. Um, Krispy Kreme is one of the boards that he sits on. Um, Web.com uh, is a board that he sits on. This guy was a former uh, CFO for a national bank, um, and I won't say which bank because then you know exactly who he is. But um, um, anyway, this gentleman has a tremendous track record, and he's going to join my board. And this is very important that we get that credibility with, with, with a good board of directors. Very cool. So, tying it back in, you were 19 years old, a college student, and running a $1 million a year type company. Correct? Yes. Describe what were some of the struggles that you were facing on a daily basis juggling all three of those? Well, I had to go to you know, my, I, I structured my classes to be done by noon or one o'clock on, on a daily basis. So, so, you know, that was good that I could, you know, I, I, I didn't lose the whole day like where I was, you know, not getting to the company until four or five o'clock. I'd get there generally in that, you know, midday range. Uh, but, you know, when, you know, when in the summer, you know, in, 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 and I say summer, but when it would start getting hot, like, in, you know, like right now, April, May, I'm still in school, but when it would get hot, you know, those ads that we were running, I mean, I'm getting dozens and dozens of phone calls from these ads coming from all over the city. Hey, I want to bid on air conditioning. And likewise, also, when it would get cold, we were getting service calls, people without heat. And, and so, you know, by the time I get to the office, we may have had 30, 40, 50 phone calls from customers looking for bids or service. Now, we had, you know, the, the business was running because I had people operating it. Actually, my father ended up, he had sold one of his restaurants. So I, I, I said to my father, you know, hey, look, I, I need some help here, you know. How would you like to, you know, you just, you know, just sold a restaurant. How would you like to come in and actually run the operations of this business? So my father joined me at that time, and, um, and, and he... Um, so by the time I ran the sales, he ran the operations, and by the time I, I, I would get to the office, many times it would be a little chaotic, you know, because of, of all the action. So, um, and then I worked into the evening doing the sales because, um, you know, people called for, they wanted a, a, a bid on air conditioning or whatever. I always wanted the husband and wife both to be there so we could get the commitment and get the signature on the contract, get the financing, et cetera. So really, the daytime was, was uh, operational and the evening was, was sales, but it worked out pretty good. And, and we had a, um, a group of telemarketers that did outbound phone calls also to set up appointments. We had a staff of salespeople also. Excellent. Now, is it true in that time your dad comes to work for you, right? Yes. Uh, is it true that shortly after your dad came to work for you, he told you, quote, if you don't quit college, I'm going to quit working for you. Now that's not a typical parent <laughs> response. Uh, what was going through your mind when you heard him say this to you? Well, what was going through my mind was that my mother was going to be very upset. Okay? <laughs> uh, because, you know, I had committed to her that, you know, I was going to finish college, okay? Uh, so, um, and so we had a very delicate situation there because um, she really wanted me to, she says, look, if you're going to be an entrepreneur, great, go do it. 
uh, if that's what your father and you are, you know, going to be, you know, handling all these things. But you have to promise me you'll finish school. And so um, that actually was a commitment that I had made to my mother. But um, things had gotten to the point where not only was I unhappy with the education I was receiving, and um, I was at, um, I, I had got, I made it to my junior year, and actually I didn't go quite three years because I had a lot of credits up front, but went probably more than a full year in, into college. So really, you know, I was going into, you know, it's kind of starting my junior year when I quit, um, but I would have never made the last couple of years because the business was, was really taking off. And we were, um, it, I mean, we had a full-fledged, I mean, in, in that world, there was companies that had been in, in heating and air conditioning for 25 years, barely doing a million dollars in sales. And we did it our first year. We won, I mean, Carrier, uh, Bryant, Fetters. We were like dealer of the year for all these different companies because we were blowing huge numbers. And, um, you know, we were selling air conditioning systems in the winter time because we go out to sell the furnace and we make a deal now's the time to get air conditioning so we had a sales pitch on why they should buy that system so basically i just couldn't do both it was it was crazy and my father said kevin you know you really you got to make a decision you, you you're either going to finish school and go to the corporate world you know or you're going to be an entrepreneur because this this company needs you you know, you, you got to get, uh, get your arms around this thing. So, is he, you know, not that he was too old at that time, but it just, um, he had, it didn't have the experience in this, in this world either. Okay, my curious mind would like to know something. By the way, did you pay your dad better than he paid you? Yeah. <laughs> uh, yes, a lot more than a dollar an hour, okay? <laughs> He got a little salary, but you know, to be honest, he wasn't high paid. Um, you know, so I got a really good deal. I, I don't remember exactly how much he was getting paid, but he got a, he got a fair salary. And um, um, yes, it, it, it definitely. Uh, you know, I, he he was a hardworking guy. My father would roll the sleeves up, and and and, and actually, we ended up. I, I got to the point where I, I realized, and here again, I found out I didn't like the restaurant business early on with my father, um, got into this business. The service aspect of this business was driving me crazy, and um, I decided uh, at a certain point some things that had gone wrong with service. And you know, selling it was easy. <clears throat> Installing it and servicing it, that was a tough thing, because getting good service men was not easy. And on that point, what was the tipping point when you decided to move on service wise what happened what went wrong my oldest sister um you know my her husband was a lawyer very skeptical guy and he's you know he's like you know to, to my sister you know um because i'm always like hey if you ever need anything you know, we, you know we're in the heating and air conditioning business he's like hey i'm never gonna let you do anything that's substantial in my home you know my, my brother-in-law right the lawyer so so finally i said look i said you know you need, you, so you, you already have air conditioning, you already have a furnace. I said, do you have a humidifier? And he's like, well, what's that? I'm like, well, in the wintertime, you know, it gets real dry, and a humidifier, we put it right on the side of the, of the, of the, of the furnace, the plenum, and it'll shoot a, just a little bit of mist in there, keep your whole home humidified, and I think you'll, you'll, you'll really see a difference in, the, in how dry your skin gets, et cetera, et cetera. And he's like, oh, you know what? What's that cost? I said, you know what, for you, I'll, I'll, I'll give you the, you know, my cost, you know, what, I think it was like a hundred dollars, you know, installed. And so I didn't make any money. I did it at my cost. And um, he and my sister, they were just heading out for vacation. They were going, I forget where, but um, it was in the middle of the winter. And I'll never forget when they got back from this four or five day vacation, they came home and their, their, um, the, the furnace had gone off while they were gone because it was installed improperly, the humidifier, and the house was was so cold that the pipes froze and burst. And so, um, I mean, this free job that I did at no profit from for my sister and brother-in-law cost thousands of dollars in damage to their home. And boy, I've never to this day ever done any work for my, my sister, brother-in-law in any capacity. <laughs> All right, so, uh, but it was very, very embarrassing. 
And this was, you know, I hate to use the word, but we, we, we employed, we didn't know it, but sort of some of these guys, were, I'll call them, they were jack legs. They were, they were you know, guys that were, had gone from place to place to place. Sure. When you're dealing with installing electrically, you gotta integrate, you know, because this is gonna, gonna work off of an electrical pulse from, from, you can't have the humidifier going on unless the furnace is on, yeah, okay? Yeah, so you gotta have some skilled people. And the guy that was installing this, had professed to be skilled, but I since found out after the fact, because I fired him on the spot then, that he had been at various other places unsuccessfully and fired in, in previous situations for similar problems. So, so that was kind of the tipping point for me. It's like, wow, I can sell furnaces, I can sell air conditioning systems, I can, you know, I'm the greatest uh, salesman out there at getting the deal, but what happens if I can't install it and really uh, know that, that I'm, I'm doing a, a good value for the customer and that I, I sold the company to one of my employees then at that point right shortly thereafter very cool um, now this ties right into my next question most of us uh, I think we go through um, stages in our life where our confidence really takes a hit um, it sounds like your sister's moment there with pipes first thing and everything <clears throat> could have hit a confidence level I, I just want to ask you you sound like a motivated confident individual you're the best salesman you know, in the world, you're thinking at that age. When and how was lack of confidence an issue for you? Well, um, so what happened, I, I, I wanted, we had a nice little business, profitable, we had a you know, good crew, we had, we had a good system for generating leads and sales, and so one of my guys bought the business. And now I had a little bit of cash, uh, I was young, and I, you know, I think I was 21 or 22 years old or something like that at that time. And I'm like, okay, what am I going to do now? Yeah. And so, uh, you know, um, I was kind of at the top of my game. As, you know, like m the, the, my friends, you know, were just getting out of college or, you know, still in college. And here I was, you know, I'd already sold my first company. You know, I, I got $80,000 when I sold the business. But, you know, go back, you know, 40 years ago, that, that's not a bad amount of money to have in your pocket for a young kid. So, um, you know, so now I'm like, but well, what am I going to do with my life? What, you know, what am I, you know, what, what's, what's my business now? So I started looking to get into a business. And I started in the Business Opportunity Classifieds, Entrepreneur Magazine, you know, Business Opportunity type publications. I was going to franchise shows. And I said, oh, I'm certainly going to find something that I want to want to do the rest of my life. But, you know, all of a sudden, Day after day, week after week, became month after month, I had nothing to do. My business was finding a business to get into. And I started really kind of losing, you know, confidence and motivation because I'm like, I, you know, there was all these fast food franchise type opportunities and, you know, donut shops and, and you know, you know, Subway sandwiches. And I'm like, how do you learn? I don't want to be in that business and, you know, print shops and, you know, but, I saw limitations in the amount of money that could be made in all of these different opportunities that, you know, what's the average guy going to make? Well, geez, I'd already been there and I wanted more. So um, I, I was beginning to think that I was never going to find really a business to get into. So, so what happened was, you know, I remember I was literally, I was flying all over the country and, and it started to become kind of fun. At, at a point now, I mean, I, I was down in the dumps because I hadn't found anything, but now I'm starting to meet with all these different entrepreneurs that were franchising their businesses, and I flew to LA and met Neil Walter. If I could just comment on what you just said a second ago, in your book you summed it up, I think very nicely, you wrote, beginning a search for a business I truly wanted to be in was like opening a door and stepping out into a fresh spring breeze. I was still hardly more than a kid, but living in the limbo of not having a business to wake up to every morning was unfamiliar territory and uncomfortable as hell. My days were filled with nothing more than a big punt. Life felt empty. I thought that was a nice way to sum up that, that part of your life. How did you stay motivated in that search before you started to hit some good opportunities? Well. I stayed motivated because I was meeting uh, some some pretty pretty cool people. Um, first, I started locally. I started in Cincinnati, and I went to there was business brokers, and you could go to a business broker. You had 100 businesses for sale. Well, half of them 
were bars and restaurants. Okay, just that was kind of like you know when you thought about owning your own business, a lot of people that's what you kind of you know delis, bars, restaurants, kind of small time type things like that. And and so I you know for the most part just ruled all of that out. Uh, so so then I started. I said, well, you know, I really I, I got to go outside of Cincinnati. I, I don't think I'm going to find what I want here. So then I started the franchise world, and now I was seeing companies. I I met a guy named Neil Balter. He had just started. He was lived in L.A. Flew to L.A. and he had just started a company called California Closets, and he had, had taken his closet and he was kind of. A, Carpenter type of guy, and 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 organized it all with all this you know different compartmentalizing and everything, and and had this, this business that started from zero, and he had five or six franchises he had already sold, and these people that bought the franchises were making big money, so he's like Kevin, I, you know I'm making a hundred thousand dollars a year per location. He said, why don't you become one of my franchisees in Cincinnati? And here again, I didn't want to. I wanted to be Neil Alter. I wanted to have the, the business of being, you know, owning all of these companies, all these franchises, not owning one. So, so I said, Neil, I'll tell you what, I really like what you're doing. He said, but like, you're running ads in Entrepreneur Magazine. How many calls do you get? It's like, oh, geez, this ad, I got, you know, I got 150 phone calls from, uh, from entrepreneurs all over the country. I said, well, you're in LA, I'm in Cincinnati, you know, who follows up on all these leads? Why do they help you out? And I, you know what, I'll tell you what, no cost to you, I don't want a salary, I got some money in the bank. On straight commission, if I can close some of these franchises, I'll help you out until I find the business I want to be involved with. So, so that was how I then started my new business, really. I became, that was my first deal, became a business broker for franchise companies. And so I, after I started following up with some of these leads that Neil had, these people, they were like, well, you know, it's too much carpenter work involved and too much this and that. I really don't want to be a California closet franchise. What else do you have, Kevin? I'm like, well, I don't really have anything else, but you know what, guess what? I can go and I tied up the rights to 30 other franchise companies and became a franchise broker. And this was now back in the um, uh, late 70s. And this was called Franchise America? Franchise America. Very cool. Now, when and how did the tri-state heating business owner and the business broker become the television entrepreneur? Okay, so there I was, um, I would do, um, the, I'm, I'm a, a franchise broker, and how these companies would sell their franchises, you know, the sophisticated ones, is they would run an ad in a local market in Cincinnati, for example, where I'm from. Okay, so California Closet Company, this is what we ended up doing with Neil. I said, I'll tell you what, I'm going to bring you in, you know, come into Cincinnati, going to run some ads in Business Opportunity Classified, and we're going to say, you know, here's a great franchise opportunity. Come down to the Holiday Inn, 7.30 Wednesday night, and, and, and meet the owner of California Closets. Okay, so we started doing that with Neil, and we would run in the classified section of the newspaper. And so we would get 15 or 20 people, 30 people, whatever, would show up at the Holiday Inn to meet Neil Balter, and we would sell a franchise or two. And we would take this around, we'd go from Cincinnati to, I did the whole Midwest, there's about 10 cities from Columbus, Toledo, Cleveland, Louisville, Lexington, Indianapolis, Pittsburgh, etc. And we, so that was kind of my, my business, was taking franchise companies around. Well, one day I was watching TV um, and, and, and cable was just starting, this is back in the late 70s, and I'm watching my television and, I, and, I, and, and there was 30 channels at that time, which was, you know, in the beginning days of cable, before cable, you had ABC, CBS, NBC, and one independent. Really, you had four channels. And when cable launched, you had 30 channels. It's like, wow, this is you know amazing. So I got I had cable in my home. And so I'm watching channel 29 and channel 30. And the and what channel 29 is a classified section selling used, you know, almost like you know, an eBay on TV. It was, you know, uh, it, but it was, you saw it in, in the newspapers today, you, you, old refrigerators, old bicycles, whatever. It was just classified on channel 29. Turn to channel 30, same thing. And I'm like, why, why, I'm paying for 30 channels, I'm only getting 29. 
this, what's, what's going on here? I think there's a mistake with my cable box because the same channel is on both. I called my cable system and I said, why, you know, there, is, is there some problem here? And he said, oh no, we don't have enough programming uh, to put on channel 30, so we just run channel 29 the second time. So, boom, a light bulb went off in my head. I'm like, I'm running all these classified ads for seminars come down to the Holiday Inn, classified, they're running classifieds on two channels. They said, hey, what if I put something on channel 30? And, and, and you know, would you be open for me giving you something to put on that channel 30? So what would that be? I'm like, I'm gonna do a TV show called Franchise America. We're gonna interview franchise companies like Neil Balter, and we're gonna tell people, don't buy that franchise until you tune in. So we ran the ads in the classified <coughs> section, and we said, don't buy the franchise until you tune in to channel 30. And here's the time periods. And that was the first ever infomercial, and this was back in the early 80s. And so these were 30-minute shows, like you see today, the real estate shows, where they show all the homes for sale. Well, this was, back in the early 80s, we sold all these different franchises for sale. And so we had Smelly and Snelling, and Subway Sandwiches, and California Closets, and, and it was a lead generation business. So that's what Franchise America was. It became a television lead generation device for franchise companies. So you match up to opportunities. You Absolutely. We, we, we were generating uh, hundreds of leads a week, then thousands a week, and then we went on national cable. And so, so what happened is, I said to myself, I, we sold a one company, we sold 100 franchises for a company called Stained Glass Overlay. This company went from, from 10 to over 100 units like this in one year. So we, the power of television was unbelievable. And so we had tens of thousands of people calling us on a weekly basis to get information, but I represented dozens of franchise companies, not just one. So we, we could move people around. So we would sell these leads multiple numbers of times to the franchise companies. So um, I, you know, I said to myself, one day a guy walked in my office and you know, he's like, hey look, you've got all this airtime selling all these franchises. Have you ever thought about selling this product? And so that's... I'll take you back on that. Yeah. Um, I would say that one of the, the clearest and best examples uh, in which Kevin Harrington has broken the mold uh, is in an infomercial for a remarkable product called the Food Saver. Does anybody remember the Food Saver? There we go. Sucks it right out. Yeah. And um, which generated many millions of dollars in sales and would take its place as the longest running product in the infomercial industry. And Kevin's all time number one seller. Kevin, what did you initially see in the product when that gentleman walked into your office that appealed to you? So here I was, this, this franchise guy, and um, I actually um, hosted a few of those shows, which was funny. I, I, my wife, I think, has the only copy of, of those because she uh, is blackmail. Uh, I, you know, it was, you know, Twenty some years ago, those shows. You know, I, you know, I, I realized I'm better off hiring talent, okay, than being in the shows myself. But, uh, but I couldn't afford talent, so I was the talent. I was the, the host of the show. But um, um, the um, uh, this guy walks in my office, and and so um, he puts down on my desk this this food sealer, and it was I didn't know what what it was. And he's t telling me about this product, and, and I'm like, I'm looking at it, and, and, and I'm thinking he's crazy, okay? Literally, you know, because I'm, I'm like, what is this? He said it's called the food saver, and, and I, what is what does that sell for? It was a big bulky thing, and and so and, and he's like, well, it's 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 a three hundred dollar piece of kitchen equipment. I'm like, well, who would pay three hundred dollars for this? I said that this, you know. You've got to be, you know, crazy off your rocker to think that this thing will sell. He says, "Let me show you some demonstrations." And I said, "Okay." He said, "Go ahead." And that, you know, in, in, in my world now today, I've learned, you know, I never close my my eyes or ears to an opportunity. Okay, so I listen. I take pitches. I mean, I get pitches everywhere I go. I don't care if it's a restaurant. I don't care if I'm. And getting a massage somewhere, the masseuse has got something she wants to pitch. Okay? <laughs> Unbelievable. So, um, you know, a taxi cab in New York City, just I was there yesterday, and, um, you know, he's, ah, you're not infomercial. 
uh, guy. I, I got something for you. So, um, you know, so all of a sudden, you see the doors lock. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, it's amazing. But um, you know, the so he takes a Coca-Cola can and he puts it into the bag and he turns the machine on and right in front of my eyes, the can starts crushing inside the, from the pressure of the sealing action. And I'm like, whoa, that, you know, that was really, that was demonstrable. That was very cool. I said, so, so why would someone buy, spend 300 bucks to crush Coca-Cola cans, you know? And he's like, what's, you know, what's the, the deal, you know? So he's like, no, 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 it's called a food saver because it saves you money in your food bill. You go to the bulk stores and you buy uh, in bulk and you buy a, a five pound block of cheese and instead of the slices that, that end up being like $6 a pound when they're individually wrapped, you buy a five pound block for you know $1.39 a pound, and you're saving 75% of your food bill because then you bring back that five pound block, you re-shrink wrap it professionally, and this was a commercial quality food sealer. Bacon, cheese, different products, it's the food saver, save money in your food bill. And I'm like, wow, that's a great pitch. So um, we did an infomercial on that product, and it's it's a billion dollar plus success. Uh, you know, we did that in 1986, I think it was, but it's 25 years, the longest running commercial product in the business now. Still on the air, still selling. I lost the rights along the way. That's a whole other story unto itself, but um, you know, the Food Saver is, is a, you'll still see it on QVC. It's a huge win, big product. After the amazing success of the Food Saver, you step back and you notice two major challenges ahead. Number one, the competition within the infomercial space was getting fierce. Number two, your business partner was not paying you the 50% split that you both had agreed to earlier. How did you respond to both of these? Well, the I had a partner, and actually my partner had, um, he owned the Cable Guide magazine, and, and so well, it was like the TV Guide of Cable. And uh, he bought 50% of my company, uh, for a promise to finance the business, um, no cash up front, because we were growing, and we were you know buying media, and we were doing all these things, and we needed capital. So he said, "Look, I have an endless amount of capital. Uh, I'll be your partner. I'll put up all the capital, run the business. I want fifty percent of your company." So we we had this company now. We were literally doing tens of millions of dollars in sales. Um, I think the 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 year. Um, that I left, and you asked, what did I do? I ended up having to actually leave my company that I own half of. The, the year I left, we were doing $30 million in sales because this guy um, had, you know, from, there's two sides of every story, but from his side, he was laying out capital and the company was making a profit, but I wasn't getting my share of the profits because you know, his attitude was he's plugging it back in, but, but there was cash in the bank, and, and to make a long story short, we basically had a disagreement, and it was time for me to go on and own my own business 100%. Because when we first did our deal, the company was Franchise America, it was a different business. Um, then we started morphing into products, and now we were going in a whole different direction. So I left, and it was funny because Franchise America, why did this company called Franchise America own a product called the Food Saver. It was kind of, it just didn't make sense in the marketplace, you know? So um, so I, I left and, um, and got my own office and started a company called Quantum uh, Market. And that was, you know, what it was basically, I said, I gotta do this on my own. I don't need a partner, especially one that's gonna pretty much, you know, control all the cash and, and, and not give me my share. So I, I started a new business, went, went out on my own. I like what you said in your book. You quote, quote, at certain moments in an entrepreneur's life, you get a gut feeling that something is about to break loose. You're about to take a risk that's going to be an essential step in climbing the ladder of success. Here's my question, Kevin. Where do you find your courage to not only face your fears, but to stand nose to nose with them until they reluctantly back away and make room for you to pass by? Well, um, I think it, it, it basically having had success at a young age with some of my previous businesses, um, you know, it, you have to sometimes just go out and do it. 
And so when I first started knocking on doors when I was 15, it was, it was a scary uh, endeavor. Um, pulling up on a bicycle and you know, you know, I just had to go do it and after I did it enough times I realized hey It's these people. They're nice people and they weren't slamming the door in my face And they would offer me you know a soda and and, and things like that So, you know, I, I, I built that business and then I built the heating and air conditioning business So I will say this um, The good news is when when I started in the early days I had some success so I had a taste of it Okay, had I failed and failed and failed um, it would have been a lot tougher uh, to keep having that courage, okay? So um, I think, you know, the, the best thing I can probably say is that if, if, if you can somehow get over the hump quickly with some small kind of success um, and, and just make it happen, that, you know, it, you, you really do need to program yourself for, for, for the mental aspect of, of building the business because, um, I mean, even today, we start businesses, you know, I'm involved in dozens of, of different companies right now, and um, each one of them requires the courage to go do it. And I think, you know, um, we, you know we have to just sometimes just, uh, just plow ahead, but, but basically because uh, I've had the success before, it gives me an advantage. Uh, here's the question is, well, first off, I uh, just want to piggyback on something. Uh, courage. I, I've learned uh, in the past, say, 12 months or so, the, the definition of courage. The willingness to sustain a wound. And I think that's what entrepreneurship really is. It's right. that willingness to keep getting back up after you take a, a blow. So for all of us out there, you know, keep being courageous. Kevin, is there any Kevin Harrington in your infomercials? Uh, well, I think... Uh, Yes, yes, not me personally. Um, I don't, uh, I don't go not into your any, face. Not my face, no. Um, I, I've only, I've actually, uh, I'll do a testimonial here and there, especially if, if I'm investing in a company. Um, you know, sometimes I will, if I really believe in the product, if it makes sense, um, you know, I'll, I'll sometimes you know, do a little, a little testimonial. Um, so that, from that standpoint, yes. But I think um, the Kevin Harrington that I think is in the commercials is an evolution of the things we've learned. Um, I have a, a, a checklist of things that, that I look for um, in, 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 in putting a, an infomercial together. And you know, I, I look for you know, magical transformation, I look for multifunctionality, and I look for um, you know, um, you know, problem solving. And I have a, actually have a, a 10 a part checklist of things. And these are the Kevin Harrington um, techniques of, of, of bringing a successful product to market. So um, when I'm doing a commercial, you know, those are the things that I that I make sure um, we've addressed as many of them as possible. Not every product will will have the capability of all ten, but if we can get seven or eight or nine of those, or you know, if we're lucky, all ten, then it, it generally uh, is is uh, a good sign that we may have a winner at our hand. So. Uh, I think the, the techniques are probably the best thing that, that, I, that I bring to the table. Okay, makes sense. When an infomercial is finished, can you sit back in the audience, just like this, and enjoy it as an audience member? Yes, and I, and I, and I feel that's very important. In fact, um, you know, I always, when I get done, when we're, you know, and when we do an infomercial, there's a lot of editing involved. And I mean, we'll do one edit, two edits, we have a rough cut, a second rough cut, a third rough cut five rough cuts, we get into a, you know, the first final pass, with, with a rough, we call it a rough, a rough track, uh, without uh, the voiceovers, without the animation, without the graphics, etc. cetera. So um, that whole process can take you know, months and months and months, and sometimes you know, three, four, five, six months worth of time and effort that goes in. You get so close to that infomercial and the edits that you almost sometimes lose an objectivity of, of, of what you're accomplishing. So, Oftentimes, what I will do at that point, and certainly when I'm done, I take the show and I, I take it and put it on the DVD, bring it into my living room, and I take my wife and I take. I have a 13 year old. Sometimes I might send it to my 22 year old, and, and I'll say, "Let's watch the show, okay?" That's and cool. so I like to see. We do this in the office, and we do this with industry people, but it's kind of uh, you know unofficial focus groups. But we yeah. get. And, and I get, you know, tremendous, and I view it now, first time, 
you know, and I'm watching the eyes of, you know, when do people, you know, tune in and things like that. So, you That's know, what I'm doing right now. yeah, I mean, I, I, I get, um, I learn a lot at, at, at sometimes at those, at those stages. So, um, absolutely, it's important to be a consumer um, as well as the producer of the show. If you had to describe your entire entrepreneurial journey in only three words or less, what would you say? Never give up. Amen. <laughs> Okay, uh, we're going to move on to the second portion, which is the questionnaire part. Okay, so if you and I could just scoot up our chairs a little facing the audience. Let's get even more intimate. Okay, these are some playful questions, but they really bring out a person's character, I think. Okay, first up, Kevin, you ready? Yeah. This is like shoot, aim, fire, or. <laughs> okay. Kevin, what is your favorite word? Ka-ching. <laughs> Maybe that's a favorite sound. I love to hear the cash register ring. Okay. What is your least favorite word? Failure. What turns you on? Finding a an exciting new product. Really, I mean, I I go. I, I do uh, a lot of what I'm doing right here today. Um, I do this um, two or three times a month um, in front of you know small groups, large groups, a thousand people, a hundred people, whatever it might be. And um, ultimately, you know what what I really get excited about is when somebody will come to me afterwards, whether it be in person or an email or something later, and say, "Wow, you know, I didn't, you know, because I'm not an inventor myself." Um, I've invented one product in 27 years, um, and actually lost a lot of money uh, on that on that project. Um, so I, I I only partner with people at, that are inventors or that have products. So so I say to anybody that when I'm speaking, I said you don't have to have a product right now. You don't have to be an inventor, but somewhere over the next month, week, year, whatever it might be, you're going to be at a cocktail party, you're going to be somewhere, some networking event, you're going to hear about something, and you're going to say, you know, that is a great idea, that's a product I think Kevin might be interested in, so I, I get, you know, we get, last year we had over 30,000 registered products that came through our process to take a look at, so that's, 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 what, what, I love. that's what I love, finding um, a new exciting product. Kevin, what turns you off? Oh boy, let's see. I, I think when 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 people come to us, um, a, a, a lot of times, you know, I, I think that sometimes we, we just have to, you know, something doesn't work. We give it our best, and a lot of times people um, they don't accept the fact that it's time to move on. I mean, not everything's going to work. Not everything's going to be a home run, and so. Uh, you know, so many times after we've invested, you know, a, a lot of our own money, a lot of our own time, um, and we we tried and we tried and we tweaked and we tweaked and we can't make it work. Uh, you know, you just have to move on. Uh, and we actually give the rights back to people. Um, we have a, when we sign a contract, we we really have an option to roll something out. So so our our basic deal says, okay, you have a product, we want an option to explore you know, whether we can make this successful or not. We only hit on one out of three successes. Uh, so two out of three are failures. So, so that's a, a tough thing to deal with. And I think you know, um, when we deal with somebody and they can't accept that, that that's, that's tough for me. I understand it, but it, it's tough for me that you know, entrepreneurs have to know when to get up and dust themselves off and go on. Um, in fact, there's a, a quote that um, I think it's Thomas J. Watts, Watson, the founder of IBM. Um, he says, "How or you know, what is the the secret to your success?" And he says, um, "I double my rate of failure." Okay, and so and that's really in my business what we do. And as 
as we, if I'm successful one out of three times, to get to 10 successes, I got to have 20 failures, okay? So, so I got to double my rate of failure to, to get to those successes. And um, I mean, it's, it, unfortunately, it, you know, if you, only, if you only have one product and it's unsuccessful and it's a failure, you're not going to be excited about that. But, but you have to understand that not everything is going to work. You got to be done with it, move on, go to the next one, and make, and make your next one a success. Then. Good answer. Let's breeze through these next ones. What sound or noise do you love? I already said it. Ka -ching. Ka -ching. No, okay. <laughs> what sound or noise do you hate? A door closing, you know, for opportunity when uh, if somebody just, when that door slams, that's, a, that's, that's, not, a, that's not a good one. Okay. What is your most prized possession? And why? I would say my, my kids, my family. Um, you know that is well, at the end of the day. That's um, you know that's no matter how many hours and days I work. Um, boy, do I love coming home uh, and hanging out with the crew. What profession, other than your own, would you like to attempt? The biggest challenge that I run into in my business, um, and starting up all the different businesses, is raising capital. For these companies, so um, I I've never been the greatest at, at being you know the money raiser, uh, but I've always said if I have the if I have the ideas, money will come, and yes, it will sometimes, but not necessarily always. So I think if I if I had to say uh, that here's a, an area that I could focus on in, in either in addition to what I do, or um, if I wasn't selling on TV, I would be a financier. Uh, to be able to use other people's money to finance successes and take a piece of the action. Okay. What profession would you not like to participate in? Well, I hate the restaurant business. Okay. <laughs> 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 and if heaven exists, what would you like to hear God say when you arrive at the pearly gates? Well, I think um, I always try to do a fair deal. Um, I try to say, I try to put myself in the shoes of the person that I'm doing the deal with because they got to go back to their lawyers, their advisors, their accountants, their wives, their husbands, whatever it may be, and, and say, this is the deal that was just presented. So, so I, I, I try to structure a fair deal. So, you know, I want to hear, that yes, um, you drove a hard bargain, uh, but you were fair, so come on in. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay, and this brings us to the third part of our little conversation with Kevin. Uh, that we call the classroom. This is where I turn over the mic to you. So if you have a question for Kevin, these are your students. Take over, please. Okay. I'll pass the mic. Speak into the mic. Uh, hey, Kevin. My name is Jake Florano. I'm currently the president of the entrepreneurship club here. All these all the people you see in the front row, they're all our members. So uh, thanks for coming here to UT. We really appreciate it. And uh, one question that we're really interested in hearing about is basically for your hero. So if you could have dinner with one person in history, dead or alive, who would that be and why? Well, I think uh, Thomas Edison was a, an unbelievable uh, creative guy. Um, I've actually been to his, um, his factory. And Edison, um, I have a picture, when I got there, I had a chance to take a picture of sitting at his desk. And I had a, you know, a really cool feeling at that particular moment. But um, he had an incubator. Uh, where you walked into this big factory and you got a stall inside uh, his business. And each and he went on a, on a daily or weekly basis, hundreds of stalls that, that he financed the development of people who had ideas and basically went from stall to stall to stall and imparted his wisdom. And I mean, that to me, um, you know, we kind of do that in, in a much different fashion. Uh, as we as we mentor and help entrepreneurs, but we don't have some. You know, we, we started something called the TD Goods and Center, and we have you know a, a, a patent lawyers and, and industrial engineers and di different people that we have access to. At one point, some of them in house, and some of them just on a on a rolodex type basis. But um, that's really um, is something that we find very exciting is, is helping people take their ideas to the next step. But you know, Thomas Edison uh, was a genius, and and um, and. So I think that if I could go back in time and sit down with him and understand 
all of, uh, you know, this was, I don't know, back in the 1700s, I guess, when, whenever he was around. So he, he, he was a, a, a hero in my mind. What would you suggest for young entrepreneurs that have to raise money? And from your experience of being an entrepreneur, you know that a lot of times you don't get the credibility, you don't get the respect, especially you know if you need a high level of investment. What would you suggest first to gain that credibility for the investors, and second to gain immediate credibility with your customers? Well, I think you kind of have to do it all at once. Depends on what your goals are. If you're, if you're, is this something you're, you're, if it's an idea that you're trying to get money for, then, you know, money people today, they want to see certain things in place before they're going to put up money. So if you don't have credibility, it's going to be tough to get the money. Okay, now, if you've already launched, okay, and you're in business, it's, you know, so it depends on where you are, really. But I think if you're in business, there's credibility in the fact that you are in business. Are you making money? There's credibility if you're making money. If you have happy customers, yes, those are all very good things. So um, ultimately, it's easier to raise money. Today, complete startups and ideas are difficult to raise money because people like to see that you know how to do it, that you know that they can see actual hardcore numbers as opposed to having to take, take the leap of faith that you're going to get there. So, so I, I recommend you know getting started, you know if you can, um, you know. That requires a large investment because of the cost of the soil is so high. It's manufacturing. So, if you can't start, maybe you have the experience that's relevant. Maybe you have prototypes, but how do you get over that hurdle? Because it's like the chicken or the egg. Yeah, I might have the customers, I might have letters of intent. Maybe I'll get their credibility, but how do you get the investors' credibility? Well, because this all has to happen. It's, it's a difficult process, but I think the key thing would be to get a team of advisors in some fashion uh, that maybe have been in this industry before that will that will vouch for the fact that if, and maybe they own equity also, uh, maybe and even if they haven't put in capital equity, um, you know the fact that you know if, if I were looking at a business that was a startup, I I I want to know for sure that the money isn't going to just go in and, and be used to figure, figure out that it wasn't going to work, okay? So, um, so now, if there's people that are involved in having done it before that, that are as part of the team, that's the credibility that, that, that's going to be needed there. Um, I mean, because many, forget about a bank giving you money, because banks are typically hard asset lenders, so forget about that. But I'm talking about even angels or venture money. Um, you're going to want to have a team that's part of this that has equity that has been there before. Uh, Kevin, thanks for coming. Um, sorry to get the NBA in Kansas City, the GSCA finals, and I see you speak the CEO of NCAA in the past years. Um, my question, piggybacks off of that, and seeing all these products throughout your life and throughout your career, um, you mentioned the magical transformation, you mentioned credibility, um, but what are some of the other major do's and don'ts when you're launching a product as far as um, pitching it and, and um, getting it out to market? Um, so the, the major do's and don'ts is the question. Yeah, I mean, I think the, you know, we, we, we like to see something that is, is proven in some fashion somewhere else. Okay, um, number one, uh, I like a unique product such that it, it doesn't already exist substantially in terms of what it, what it performs already in the marketplace, okay? So if you've got an idea for a product and I can say, well, geez, you know, that is gonna clean, you know, uh, my driveway or something and, and, and there's already, you know, two or three items that you can go to Home Depot and substantially do the same thing already, then it's not maybe unique enough for me. So that, that's number one. Um, but, you know, also, um, you know, it's, 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 it's got to be, you know, one of the things a lot of people forget about, and you know, someone will come to me and say, well, geez, we can make a lot of money. I got something that costs, you know, eight or nine dollars to make it. We can sell it for twenty dollars. You know, we can make look, ten, twelve dollars a piece on these. This is going to be huge. You know, the numbers have to make sense, okay? The margins have to make sense. You have to allow for the distribution uh, channels in the process. And a lot of times, people have researched out, well, if you're going to get something into Walmart, okay, you know, you've got, 
not just the cost of goods, but you got to have great packaging, you got to have a salesman get it in there, you got to have freight into the store. Don't forget about the returns that you're going to get back, the advertising allowances, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, you got to run the numbers and you got to you got to know all the costs that are that are associated. So, um, you know, I think that um, you know the I could spend you know probably an hour talking about all the things that I look for, but. Um, you know, I, we talked. You talked about magical transformation, uniqueness aspect, um, being able to you know understand the numbers, um, et cetera, et cetera. So you know, maybe some other time we could you know spend it, you know, spend a little bit more time on it. But those are a few of them. Yes, sir. Hey, Kevin. Um, moving to a more personal uh, subject, uh, we talked about how uh, your father affected you growing up. I don't know if we hit on. I know you have a son. You said you have a son. Is he 22? I have 20, 22 and 13. Two okay. boys. Um, can you talk about the effect that you had on them growing up, kind of switching the roles? Can you speak on that for a moment? Yeah. Um, I think um, my 22 year old, um, I want to make sure that he did graduate. So he just graduated from Penn State last year. Um, and, and so what's funny now, he, he got a job out of college. Uh, we talked about him maybe coming into the, into the business. And I said, you know, I really like to see you. He, he lives in Philadelphia. I'm uh, working for Sprint uh, Communications as a as a corporate uh, sales uh, for large accounts, not not in a kiosk and a mall type of thing, but corporate sales. And so he's got a nice job right out of college, which is good. Um, but when he was interviewing for jobs, um, I, I found it very interesting. Because, you know, he said, you know, I, mean, I said, what kind of job are you looking for? He said, well, I don't want a job that has a finite amount of, of income. Potential. He said, I want a job that, you know, if I'm successful in it, you know, that, you know, there's a commission structure to the back end. Okay? So I, I said, you know, I, you know, that was something that, you know, I said, you know, that probably if I were in the corporate world, you know, I would, you know, I think having an upside as opposed to the biggest challenge, you know, in, in, a, in a corporate situation with a salary and a, and a you know, a, a finite amount of, of pay on a weekly basis. I, I personally would have a tough time. So I, I like you know, to be more motivated, and I think my son now, you know, he's in the business of having to go out and get leads and try to sell phones to, to major carrier, to major accounts. So um, I think he, you know, I, I know that he, he likes the fact that if he gets an account that's 300 phones, you know, that's going to be a good deal for him. So I think, you know, my, so I think he's definitely, uh, you know, has approached his corporate world in, 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 in a similar fashion probably that I would. So that, that's probably one of, one of the things that I, I figured out. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can you talk about the balance between an entrepreneur just jumping into an adventure or should they waste some time to get experience? Like, talk about that balance. I mean. Well, I'm probably not the best one to tell you about now. <laughs> so, okay. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, I, I think I said in my book somewhere, um, someone said, Kevin, uh, you remind me, um, and Joseph just said it, um, um, ready, fire, aim, okay? So I don't necessarily think that that's how you should do it. But, um, you know, I think that sometimes that's what entrepreneurs do do, and sometimes, you know, let's put it this way. If you can get into a business that you're not going to lose a lot of capital, um, and you know, and, and, you, and you got a chance to, to you know to, to jump in and do it. Sometimes you, you learn as you go, and that's and so so that that's been me, you know, up until recently. Because now you know, <coughs> I, you know, I, I use my own money to do deals, but I also I raise money, and I use you know, I was in New York this week. I'm raising institutional capital right now to take a, one of our companies to the next level. So you can't walk in to an institutional investor and say my business. Motto is ready, fire, aim. Okay, you need to be structured and have use of proceeds and and a defined system on how you're going to uh, build that business. Okay, but uh, it, it, at the same time, I think some of our projects. I mean, we we have two kinds of projects that we do. So maybe this is probably the best way to summarize this: is that we have certain projects that we do that. You know that we're very structured, very planned. We do focus groups. We do research. We, you know, we really look at them A to Z. We put our money into these projects, and, and we run them, you know, like, a, you know, like clockwork. We have other things we, we call a kind of test before we invest, and you know, those we kind of slap into some kind of a test pattern somewhere, 
sell it into a catalog, put it on a home shopping network, you know, do some kind of market test and, and, and throw it out there in, in some kind of an unofficial type of capacity, more or less, that we get a read on it before we then put it into a more regimented uh, scenario. So I think entrepreneurs can be at different levels like that also. And, 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 I, and I think it just depends on the business and, and, and your own uh, personal strengths uh, on, on which way you go. Last question. Okay. Um, it seems like you cover a lot of, uh, you do a lot of the entrepreneurial aspects and you do, and you run the numbers, you do the financing aspect too. Um, what do you consider yourself more of, uh, an entrepreneur or a, uh, or a or like a financier? Because it seems like you're just, it seems like you're a broker at the same time. Yeah. No, definitely, uh, I'm an entrepreneur. And um, um, I think um, the, Joseph, I, what was that, you said courage, you said something about being able to sustain a wound, a wound for, for long periods of time. That, you yeah, just that's said that's that. me, correct. And I would describe <laughs> that as entrepreneurship also. Okay, so, um, no, absolutely. Um, it is, uh, it's not for everybody, but, you know, it's, it, I think, the, the probably, uh, I think we're, we're, we're finished here with the last question now, but I think that, you know, um, you know, I, I, I sometimes uh, close on, on, a, on something I've lived my life with for, for many, many years, and it's being an entrepreneur it's with a vision, okay? So I, I wake up in the morning and I say, whatever I vividly imagine and ardently desire and sincerely believe, if I enthusiastically act upon it, then it must inevitably come to pass. And, and I think that that is how I live my life, and I think entrepreneurs, uh, you know, it must inevitably, come, must inevitably come to pass. Maybe it's gonna take a little bit of pain there for, for a wound for a while, but you'll get there if you follow uh, those processes, so. Let's give Kevin Harris a big Feel free to network amongst yourselves, and we're going to do a couple photos here with Kevin with some of the sponsors, and thank you for coming today. Look forward to the next one. Uh, check out JosephWarren.net.